Trail of Bits. Dispatches from technology's future. Let's say you had to protect your life savings, in cash, all by yourself. You'd need to figure out a lot of things, but hey, there's this book. It's been around as long as anyone can remember, and it tells you the 30 steps you need to take to protect it so no one can steal it. What kind of steel to buy for the vault, how to do the welding, how to put together the door, that kind of stuff, but really detailed. So you build it, and one day about 10 years later, you find out that steps 14 and 24, they're wrong. And they're wrong in a way that makes it easy for your whole protection scheme to be foiled by any kid with like a playing card and a stick of gum. Well, in December 2021, that's what happened. But not just to one person. Using the procedures from some well-known academic papers, software developers around the world had implemented some complicated encryption schemes for banks and exchanges. That encryption protected billions of dollars. But the instructions the developers followed had fatal flaws. Those billions of dollars were suddenly an easy target for criminal and nation-state hackers. Fortunately for all of us, there's a guy named Jim. Yeah, yeah. Two years ago, Trail of Bits lead cryptography analyst Jim Miller went to a conference, and he left one of the talks early. I ended up having to leave about halfway through to go get some tea. But he kept mulling over what he'd heard. And that eventually led to a series of revelations. Revelations that inspired the research this episode is about. Jim didn't set out to be a crypto hero. He set out to get a drink. In this episode, we tell the story of the bug that Jim and his colleagues found, how they found it, and how the team created and published new and freely available documentation to help cryptographers and developers avoid the same kinds of mistakes. We'll tell you why Jim and his team even started looking for problems in the first place. How following the trail from academic curiosity about a bug in an e-voting system to implementation problems in the blockchain world led to the discovery of critical vulnerabilities across a range of systems run by some of the best companies in the business. It's like our own little geeky detective story. Before we tell you Jim's story, you need to know about something called a zero-knowledge proof. For those of us who use the internet, so all of us, Zero knowledge proofs are changing. Actually, they've already changed the way things are protected online, especially in the blockchain space. Zero knowledge proofs are a pretty old technology. They go back to the 1980s. That's Matthew Green. He's a cryptographer at Johns Hopkins and a kind of man about town in the cryptography world. Zero knowledge proofs were originally invented as kind of a privacy technology. Let's say I know a secret, like the location of buried treasure, and you don't. But let's also say that you need to be sure that I know the secret. Maybe I promise to use some of my treasure to pay you for something and you want to make sure I'm good for it. I'd need to prove to you that I know the secret, but of course, I don't want to actually tell you the secret because then you'd know where my treasure is too. A zero-knowledge proof is a mathematical tool that allows me to prove to you that I know a secret without actually telling you the secret. So you get proof that I know the secret, but beyond that, you have zero knowledge about me. Let me give you an example. Let's say that I have a um, proof that I have some funds, but I don't want to tell you my exact bank balance, and I don't want to tell you where my, my, my funds are. So we might together write a little program that checks the blockchain, make sure the funds are greater than some amount that we both agree on, and outputs yes if that information is true. If I prove to you that I have this amount in my bank balance, you learn that fact, but you learn nothing else. There's zero additional knowledge. You don't learn where my bank balance is. You don't learn what my bank balance is. You just learn that that particular statement is true. There are lots of ways to use zero knowledge proofs. I could log into a website without telling the website exactly who I am. And there were other advances in the area of eCash where I could use zero knowledge proofs to prove that I possessed a coin. I could spend that coin with you, but I didn't have to tell uh, a merchant, for example, who I was and they wouldn't be able to track me. And this was all kind of interesting, and the privacy capabilities were important. But in the early 2000s, people started to design new forms of zero-knowledge proof that were more efficient. Well, everything's more efficient except the name. Zero-knowledge succinct non-interactive arguments of knowledge. You'll be pleased to know there's a nickname for that. ZK snarks. You'll probably hear that term a lot. And what's special about these is they're still zero-knowledge proofs, 
in the sense that I can prove to you that a mathematical statement is true or that I ran some program and it output true. What's different is that the size of that zero-knowledge proof is very, very small. And if most people on the planet have never heard of ZK proofs or ZK snarks, part of the reason is that while everyone's aware they're using more encryption than ever, these days, when we hear the word crypto, 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 crypto. It's generally within a story talking not about cryptography per se, but about cryptocurrency. This really irritates a lot of cryptography nerds. They think cryptocurrencies are, you know, cute. But as much as the purists hate to admit it, the financial success of cryptocurrency is fueling, actually funding, the most concentrated period of advancement in the field of cryptography since the dawn of humankind. For the first time since the advent of the World Wide Web, encryption isn't tied to the movement of money. It's tied to the manufacture of money itself. Even with Bitcoin's wild price fluctuations, the biggest banks, hedge funds, and payment systems in the world depend on cryptocurrencies, and even countries have adopted them as legal tender. Cryptography is literally the coin of the digital realm. Now, before you think we're about to try to sell you some Dogecoin, it's almost certain that while they're driving current development, cryptocurrencies, blockchain technologies and the like, they're not the pinnacle of cryptographic utility. They are, though, the most practical, generally useful application of cryptography we've ever seen. Which is ironic. The security community has long tried to protect privacy through encryption, but it's been so frustratingly difficult to implement that it's remained the realm of geeks, spies, and the tinfoil hat brigade. But applying cryptography to something we all understand, money, that opened the floodgates. We can expect even more democratic use of cryptography in the future. But cryptocurrency is exactly why ZK proofs and ZK snarks and a whole range of other things are getting so much attention these days. They make blockchains run faster. For example, um, the Ethereum system is a bunch of volunteers who are executing these programs called smart contracts. Here's Matt Green again. And all of these people are untrustworthy. And they're all kind of assumed to be trying to steal money from you and, you know, tamper with the execution of your smart contract. The way systems like Ethereum deal with this today is they actually require everybody in the network to run the smart contract program a second time to make sure that what happened in the smart contract is correct. Thousands and thousands of people run that program a second time to double check the work, make sure that there was no cheating. And this works okay, but you can see the problem is it requires you to do, you know, a thousand times as much work. And this is why systems like Ethereum are so slow. They can only handle a few dozen transactions globally per second. So the big dream is that rather than having that whole program be run a second time, we can actually send out one of these succinct zero-knowledge proofs to the whole world. And then all we have to do is check that little tiny zero-knowledge proof, and we know that the, the transactions were all run correctly and all of the results are correct. So, zero-knowledge proofs let people prove something by giving away a very limited piece of information. ZK snarks make that process more efficient. Great. But the real challenge that remains, crypto, and by that I mean cryptology, crypto is like really hard to get right. And the more demand there is for easier, faster, but stronger ways to use encryption, the more people and companies use it, and the fewer people understand what's going on behind the curtain. It's a perfect storm. Zero knowledge proofs are complicated. More people are using them. And a lot of the developers who use them don't understand how they work. They just kind of shove them into their applications and hope it all works. So when it comes to modern encryption anyway, it turns out that hope actually is a strategy. It's just not a very good one. It's January 2020, before the pandemic shutdowns. Trail of Bits cryptographer Jim Miller is at the Real World Crypto Conference in New York City. One of the talks he's wanting to see is called This Is Not a Proof, Pitfalls in Real World Verifiable Elections. It's about some problems researchers have uncovered in an open source e-voting system called Helios Voting. We've linked to the talk and the paper it was based on in the show notes. Jim wasn't particularly interested in e-voting, but he wanted to hear about a bug that researchers had discovered in the system. The bug undermines zero-knowledge proofs. 
It allowed attackers to trick someone into believing that a statement was true when it wasn't. Remember what he said at the beginning of the episode that he left the talk early? Yeah, so I listened to a few minutes of the talk and it was interesting, but I ended up having to leave about halfway through to go get some tea or talk to one of my colleagues or something like that. As I said, Jim wasn't super interested in e-voting, but something from the talk stuck with him. He kept rolling it around in his head after he left. There was this really cool issue found related to the insecure use of what's known as the Fiat Shamir transform. Oh dear. To make the rest of this a little bit less gobbledygooky, we need two more concepts. The Schnorr protocol and Fiat Shamir transform. This won't hurt a bit. There are lots of ways to do zero-knowledge proofs. One of the most common was cooked up by a German cryptographer named Klaus Schnorr. A Schnorr proof is interactive, a two-way street. You have to generate something random, send it to a verifier, or have them send something back and then generate the final proof. Jim says it works, but it takes three steps. You need someone to respond to you. And specifically in the blockchain world, that's kind of a non-starter. Those three interactive steps slow things down. And when you're dealing with things like money, slow is bad. That's the Schnorr proof. It's an effective way to perform a zero-knowledge proof, but it's a bit slow because it's a two-way interaction. Enter Amos Fiat and Adi Shamir. They're cryptographers. And back in the 80s, they figured out a way to speed up an interactive protocol like Schnorr. Fiat and Shamir developed a technique that turns the proof into a one-step process. Instead of sending a message, receiving a challenge, processing it, and then computing and sending the final proof back, you do it all at once. Now you can send a single message and the receiver can confirm the proof. Boom. One step. No more back and forth. Cryptographers call this the Fiat Shamir transform. So it turns out that this transformation is fairly generic, and you can apply it to really any proof system that follows this, the same structure that the Schnorr protocol has. So in practice, you can really apply this to, to pretty much all proof systems to make them non-interactive. So you'll see it in Schnorr, in Bulletproofs, in some ZK snarks. So you go all the way down, and on some level, you probably see this Fiat Shamir transform being used. Does that cover it, or should I go into it more? Nope, that's enough. Researchers looking at that e-voting system have recognized that there are two ways to do a Fiat Shamir transformation, and one of them is weak. Okay, back to the conference. Jim was still thinking about that talk, so he wrote something. So I ended up writing this blog post, but I just kind of quickly threw something together in an afternoon and just threw it onto the Trail of Bits internal blog, which is where we can just talk about something that's on our mind. Trail of Bits internal blog posts are dispatches from our engineers and consultants about things they find interesting. They're not for public distribution. And it wasn't until probably like a year after I made the initial internal blog post where one of our editors came to me and said, hey, this is a cool blog post. Can we, you know, spend some time cleaning it up and maybe make it a public post? And as I was going through it, I kind of didn't like where the end of the post was, which is where I was talking about these Fiat Shamir issues. So Jim started reworking that blog post for public consumption. And as he dug in, it started becoming clearer that this vulnerability affected a lot more than e-voting. And then, to drive that point home, a customer came to Trail of Bits with a problem. Someone had attacked their zero-knowledge-based security system and gotten away with a small amount of money. The company couldn't figure out how it happened. Jim's team started reviewing the code, and all of a sudden it started looking familiar. This bug? The one that had subverted the voting system? These people had it too. Wow, okay, this is actually a real thing. This isn't some kind of uncommon theoretical issue that popped up once in a random election scheme. Like, this actually happens in other places, too. To confirm his findings, Jim joined up with another scientist. Dr. Serang Noether, who had previously worked with Monero on some of their zero-knowledge proofs. The two of them, and their respective teams, found that lots and lots of places were using code that made them susceptible to being hacked. As part of the investigation, Jim double-checked the code and the academic paper on which the code was based. And he noticed something was weird about what the developers had done. They implemented step-by-step step exactly what the paper said. We looked at the paper, I saw the recommendation for the Fiat Shamir transform, and they did exactly what the paper recommended. The vulnerability was there, in the code, in the academic paper. And developers around the world had inserted that code into security protocols in all kinds of zero-knowledge proof systems. This wasn't carelessness. This wasn't sloppy work. The engineers and developers had followed the instructions step by step from peer-reviewed academic papers. But the papers were wrong. 
I was like, how is that even possible? All these papers are peer reviewed. How could there possibly be such a glaring issue in a paper that no one has mentioned or caught before? And that's when it really hit me like, wow, not only is this a real issue that's affecting a lot of different proof systems, but the scale of this is going to be pretty big because, you know, not only do security people generally not know about these issues, but it even seems like a lot of cryptographers aren't fully aware of these issues either. The papers everyone was cribbing from were spectacularly opaque and a little hand wavy. You go to step four and it says, oh yeah, for this step, actually read this paper from the 80s that kind of did something similar and then continue on to step five. Of course, everyone's going to mess that up. That's not the right way to produce this kind of guidance. And because the papers it pointed to are both hard to follow and also wrong, and because every project followed the papers, the problem is everywhere. This is a legitimately widespread issue. Like, wow, this is, this is honestly kind of terrifying. Matt Green, the Johns Hopkins cryptographer, says this thing with the papers happens a lot. He himself made a program that depended on an academic research paper that itself depended on another academic research paper that was flawed. This is actually how most of cryptography works. It's collaborative, community-based, and there's a lot of trial and error. Meaning, as Jim Miller says, this is all part of the process. And I don't want to make it seem like all the fault lies on the shoulders of these kind of theoretical cryptographers, right? You know, with all cryptography, the most important part is collaboration and having as many people staring at something for as long as possible. There is some good news in this. While the problem is widespread, it's easy to fix. It's just a one to two line fix. Just make the adjustment, include all of the information in the transform, and you're good to go. The Trail of Bits team looked at the issue and concluded a couple of things. First, developers were trying to find the documentation of how to do these proofs correctly. But there just wasn't enough of it, and some of what's out there is wrong. And second, since this wasn't a case of developer laziness, if we made the documentation, people would use it. Jim's team realized that our job wasn't to fix what was out there. It was stopping it from happening in the first place. It's just a lack of information. It's a lack of knowledge around this specific issue and other kind of implementation considerations that, again, aren't always covered in these academic papers. The team envisioned a collaborative, open-source project shared under Creative Commons licensing. Anyone could use it free of charge. The project would provide the documentation that Jim and the Trail of Bits team feel is missing, not to replace academic papers, but to provide an instruction manual on how to implement in practice what the papers describe in theory. The idea is that we want to produce this guidance that goes into all the nitty-gritty details that are essentially out of scope for these academic papers. So we talk about similar issues, we talk about how to generate certain random values, we talk about other things that, again, won't be covered in these academic papers for a variety of reasons. Over the course of three months, Jim, along with Trail of Bits cryptographers and engineers, created and quality controlled the guide. They called it ZK Docs. It's available now at zkdocs.com. ZK Docs provides comprehensive, detailed, and interactive documentation on zero-knowledge proof systems and related primitives. It's my hope that through ZK Docs, we get a collaborative effort across a variety of zero-knowledge proof schemes and really just a lot of non-standard cryptographic protocols generally, and that we do this through free and open-source software so that everyone can access it free of charge. It was posted in late December 2021. Since then, hundreds of cryptographers and thousands of developers have read through ZK Docs and used the interactive calculators. And they've started collaborating. The community has begun making contributions to the project. To us, that's a home run. And it's my goal that no developer will ever have to develop something by just looking at the original academic paper. You can learn much more about Zero Knowledge Proofs on the Trail of Bits blog at blog.trailofbits.com. There are links in the show notes on these articles and more. In Serving Up Zero Knowledge Proofs, Jim Miller uses a tennis analogy to describe some of the issues we discussed in this episode. Trail of Bits and Matthew Green team up to use zero knowledge proofs to form a trusted plane in which tech companies and vulnerability researchers can securely communicate. In Reinventing Vulnerability Disclosure Using Zero Knowledge Proofs, a research project that's part of a larger DARPA-funded effort. In December 2020, a Trail of Bits intern wrote an extensive post called Reverie, an optimized zero-knowledge proof system. Reverie is a ZK proof system using techniques from secure multi-party computation that optimizes for prover efficiency and doesn't require any trusted setup. 
And by the way, another Season 1 episode dives deep into our internship and winternship programs. Learn more about these incredible opportunities to make a difference at trailofbits.com slash careers. Season 1 of Trail of Bits is now available for download wherever you get your podcasts. The people who worked on this episode are Chris Julin, Emily Havik, Joe Dobkin, Trail of Bits CEO Dan Guido, Jim Miller, Matthew Green, and hi, I'm Nick Selby. I'm the director of the software assurance practice here at Trail of Bits. Chris Julin made our theme music. Trail of Bits helps secure some of the world's most targeted organizations and devices. We combine high-end security research with a real-world attacker mentality to reduce risk and fortify code. We believe the most meaningful security gains hide at the intersection of human intellect and computational power. Learn more at trailofbits.com. On Twitter, we are at Trail of Bits. Dan Guido's Twitter is at dguido. And I'm at fuzztech.